Um, yes, yeah, so like Keith said, my name is Matthew Slazak. I am a principal consultant here at RPI. I've uh, been here for seven-ish years now, something like that, I can't remember. Um, but I'm principal consultant over on the HCM team. And uh, like Keith said, with me uh, making her RPI webinar debut is Hannah Alt. So, I'm a senior business analyst on our HR team. Uh, focusing right now on uh, public sector clients. So really excited to talk more about how we're using HR in the public sector realm today. Great. And so just to kind of give you an overview of what we're gonna talk about, we're gonna start with building blocks of a successful HR organization, things you can do to set your organization up for success in GHR. Then we're gonna just highlight a couple modules that are part of HR talent that we see uh, be really successful with some clients uh, that are in this realm. Um, and then we'll highlight some of the regulatory and data security standards and some reporting that's kind of inherent to GHR that can be really helpful. And then as Keith mentioned, questions at the end. So if you have questions, pop them in the chat and we'll address them at the end. Yeah, absolutely. So when we talk about uh, public sector, I know uh, we don't always have a lot of uh, webinars or we don't necessarily hear a lot of them, uh, but RPI does have quite a bit of experience with public sector. Uh, highlighted on the screen right now are just a few of the public sector clients that we've had. Uh, we also have several more that are in flight right now, so uh, hopefully if we redo this presentation in a year or two, we'd actually see a whole bunch more up on the screen as well. So uh, we do have quite a bit of experience with it. Um, also, you know, on a personal side, um, I personally came from a hospital which used to be part of the State Department of Health or was spun off of the State Department of Health. So I had 16 years of uh, kind of public sector experience uh, where we had all the benefits and nuances of public sector with, uh, without actually being part of it. Um, so very familiar with that and we, uh, as an organization, we do have a lot of experience in the public sector side. So let's dive into the building blocks of the organization itself. So the first thing that we're gonna call out is really the strength of HR talent. Uh, the HR talent, global HR, you're gonna hear me kind of use them interchangeably. One of the big selling points of it is that it is a flexible organization structure. So what this really means is that no matter how your organization looks in real life, the system will adapt to it. You don't have to really be bound by, for example, if you were an S3 client right now, you don't have to live in that environment where it was company, process level, department, cost center. Really, we can reflect your organization as it truly exists. And especially when we're looking at our public sector clients, we see a lot of people who kind of got bound into that or they you know, are looking at it and saying, well, wait a second, we have this whole department over here, the Department of Agriculture, and there's a whole bunch of subsections inside there, but we can't really show that anyway. And so it kind of lives on an org chart somewhere else that somebody is maintaining. But this system by itself allows us to actually build it within the system itself. So you don't have to have that one FTE who's updating the org chart every uh, month or two whenever something changes with it. We also are able to have single or multiple organizations in one tenant. So when we're looking at our multi-tenant cloud environment, we can have basically, for lack of a better term, the HR organization, you can think of it as that company, that high level. So if the, if the organization at the top really is very unique and really there's no interplay between all the other uh, sections of it, you can actually have it as a standalone organization if you wanted to. Or, in a more preferred way, we would really want to have that as an organization unit inside there. The important thing here is, no matter what, when we're looking at it, this is all user-defined. You don't have to worry about being locked into a certain structure that exists that M4 created a long time ago. We can really create your organization as it truly exists. The most important thing to think about, and we see this a lot with all of our clients, whether coming from the S3 world or from a different system entirely, is the HR organization structure is not the supervisor structure and it is not the accounting structure. All three of these can be designed to be fully independent of each other. So when we're looking at things like reporting or if we want to see an org chart, anything like that, we do not have to be bound by, well, the supervisor says this, we can have a matrixed organization. 
We can have the accounting structure where people show up in multiple organization units and still play by that accounting structure the right way. So what does this actually look like? So just showing you quickly a kind of high level organization chart of a sample county government. You'll notice that up at the top, we've got the county itself, the main entity of the organization. And then we've got some sections underneath it. So the administration section, which has sub departments of human resources and finance and procurement. And underneath there in human resources, we've got the general HR department, your HR generalist who kind of do everything, the straw that stirs the drink in the HR world. <laughs> um, we also have a subsection of our benefits and payroll. Um, we also have an entirely separate section, which is our law enforcement section. So inside there, we've got the sheriff and we've got the jail. And over in the library, we actually want to show that there's metro branches and rural branches because it's all part of the co same county but we want to see that different structure inside there. We've also got the Parks and Rec inside there by itself, and you'll notice that there's not any subsections of it. Now, the nice thing about this organization structure is as we build it out, you don't have to have all those layers that we're used to. We can actually have something kind of being that standalone at Parks and Rec. There doesn't have to be a sub-department or anything. We can build that into the structure. And so on the next slide here, you can start to see all these stars, these are where they actually live on the person's individual work assignment. So what they actually do in the organization. Um, so we have those mapped inside there like that. So you can see that we have our benefits and payroll side who have their own little department, but then we also have Parks and Rec, and that's its own department as well. Even though they're different layers of the organization, we can still see that structure and still have it show up in the person's individual work assignment. And this is all toggled at the end of the day by a little flag on the organization unit called include and select lists. And as soon as we do that, if I flip that flag on the parks and rec department, somebody can have it on their work assignment. So just a nice little way for you to kind of break free of the kind of old, uh, old thinking of it. Uh, we can really reflect that structure as it's, as it's needed. Another sample that we're going to show you real quick is like a school district. So here we have a school district where the top level entity again is our district itself. And then we've got our administrative areas. So we've got things like the business office and community ed and facilities and student, uh, student services, etc. We've got those as individual departments. But then we decided to break it all out and we want to say, okay, at that top level, can I see all of my elementary schools together or my middle schools together or my high schools together? And then we also have a unique entity over here, which is our central school. So even though it has an elementary and a middle and a high school, we kind of move those layers around inside here so we can see that at a different level. Um, you'll notice over here with the West High School, I also broke that out where we have the academics department and our uh, academic section or the athletic section or the arts and music. Um, consider this as basically something that could live on all of those different areas. Honestly, I excluded them from here because uh, the slide was going to get way too big. <laughs> so, but we can reflect that structure inside all of our other, uh, all of our other schools. And again, right back to where we were talking about how do we flag this and how do we let that be on somebody's individual, um, on individual work assignments. Again, think about that flag uh, that we showed you and the stars are the things that we're actually showing on people's work assignment. So the important thing here is remember it's a very flexible, flexible structure and you can really define it yourself. And you mentioned earlier that the manager structure doesn't have to match this org Correct. structure, right? So think about that as if maybe you had one um, superintendent that was above the elementary and the middle school but not the high school. So that supervisor could have reports in these departments and maybe not the other, but they don't have to align at all. So your supervisors can cross org units they can kind of uh, be just as flexible as the org structure here. Right, right. And that goes across the board for school districts, any of the county governments, anything like that. So very flexible, user defined. So now we've defined our structure. So how do we categorize our workforce within that structure? So that's where jobs and positions comes into play. So um, these are flexible components to help define that workforce and what they do. 
Um, so uh, if you've ever worked with Matt, you've definitely heard him use this definition, but uh, at, at the simplest level, a job is what you do and a position is where you do it. So uh, the, the first example here, what do you do? You're a teacher. And then um, in this case, where do you do it? Or maybe what's your specialty? Uh, science teacher, math teacher, history teacher. So that's a pretty common way we see organizations break that down. Um, another option maybe in a government setting would be an office support specialist. It could be a progressive position. So you come in, you're an office support specialist one, based on qualifications or tenure, you can move through a level one, level two, level three, et cetera. So another way to kind of break that down um, and to be a little more detailed, or sometimes they are one to one. Sometimes you have an officer position and all of your, or officer job, I'm sorry, and then you have an officer position and all of your officers are just officers to you and your organization. Um, so that can also happen. You do have to have a job and a position at all times. Mm -hmm. So you can't skip levels like you can in the org structure. Um, but these are kind of the building blocks of what your workforce does in the organization. So now you have the what and you have the where, we need the who. So that's the work assignment. So this is where we actually get to take that position and make it unique to the individual in your organization. So if you see here, I've got it noted that both Matt and I are science teachers. So we are both assigned to the science teacher position. What makes it unique to us is our work assignment. So what's cool about this is this is where you can really personalize that that position to that person. Um, the most common uh, item would be your pay, right? So Matt might be a tenured teacher and maybe I'm a first year teacher. So we're in the same position, but we don't have the same step and grade schedule or uh, step and grade, grade, <laughs> <laughs> or maybe just pay rate if you're in, in a structured situation. Um, maybe our accounting units are different, right? Maybe we uh, are budgeted differently based on our position. And maybe we're in a different location. Maybe I teach at East High School and he teaches at North High School. Um, we can all still have the same position and make things unique to our work assignment. So uh, that's just the next level there. Right. Just remember, again, underscoring of flexibility. It's very flexible for any, any environment you can think of. Right. And what if in your organization you have multiple roles, right? So this next page shows uh, a work assignment screen for a resource that has three work assignments. So um, Matt and I can share the same position, but I as an individual can also serve in multiple roles. So if you'll see the top one here, I'm a science teacher. Uh, that's my main, you'll see it says primary, yes. That's my main, my like one FTE position, right? But in the fall, I'm also a volleyball coach. So uh, this reflects my true work in the organization. Maybe I have a different pay rate. I have a different manager, right? I report to a different department at that time of year. Um, so this reflects all of that. Both Tom and Matt as my manager could see me in manager space. That's inherent to, to the system. You don't have to configure that in any way. If they're my manager, they're gonna get to see me um, to a certain degree. And then maybe once a year um, when our school uh, is a polling place, I also serve as an election aide. So, the county and the school district are all in one organization. This can reflect that here as well, that I have all of these work assignments, probably different pay rates, different um, reporting structure here. And the important thing to note on this is that all of these work assignments are all tied to one single employee record. As long as we have that, that single organization structure. So as Hannah noted with the elections aid, totally different structure. If we had that set up as a different organization within our, uh, within our county, for example, we would not be able to have that crossover. So this is why we really recommend that people stick to one organization at the top level and then have multiple layers underneath it. Um, another thing to note here is, Hannah mentioned that all, you know, Tom and myself get to see Hannah's work assignment in there. But security is innate on this, and we'll talk a lot about security later on. I can only see Hannah's science teacher work assignment as a manager. I cannot see the volleyball coach or elections aide. The security is innate, and it's going to make sure that we can only see the people that we're supposed to see in that role that they have right there. And just some uh, cool things that you can see in the work assignment screen. So if you have multiple work assignments, uh, the system will calculate like a total pay rate for you and your total FTE across those work assignments. Um, so that's a nice feature to be able to look at, you know, the total uh, resource here based on all of their work assignments. And then in each work assignment, you also can get a position history. So see here, I was hired in September as a science teacher and promoted to a senior science teacher. So you get a really nice full picture across the work assignment of what that resource has done at the organization. 
All right. So the next thing that we see a lot in our public sector clients is we start to talk about our unions and bargaining units. Again, talking back about when I was working at the hospital, we had, uh, I believe it was five different unions and one of those unions had three different, different bargaining units inside there. Each one of those would have their own, for example, um, not necessarily pay rates because they a lot of times were kind of in lockstep, but they might have different rates for benefits or different accrual plans. The system does support unions and bargaining units without a problem. Those unions and bargaining units can then be attached at the position level and or on the work assignment level, uh, depending upon how you have your default rules set up. Again, this would be one of those uh, deep dis design discussions we'd have at the beginning. Um, but we can set those up in either place. But most importantly, the reason why we really want to make sure that those are reflected in our system is that we can build out custom groups on this. And based on our unions and bargaining units, again, we're talking about our benefit eligibility, the overall eligibility, maybe the rate plans are different between those different org units. We can build those custom groups out and allow that to happen automatically. You don't have to necessarily think about this person individually and how much should they pay for their health insurance. That we build out the custom group the right way and we're gonna have that automatic. Also really important for COLA processing. So cost of living adjustments that are happening, you know, hopefully every year, uh, or in the situation that I was always in, it was always, you know, oh, we just signed a new contract, new collective bargaining agreement, so now we have to do a retro pay for 3% for three years ago. Um, so <laughs> really important for those custom groups to be built out with our unions and bargaining units to allow for that calculation. Also performance evaluations. You know, I mentioned the single, uh, single union with three different bargaining units inside there. That actually, because of how we had them, or because of how the, um, before, uh, because of how the collective bargaining agreement was built out, there were a total of six different performance evaluation forms for those three different bargaining units within that one union. But again, build those out the right way, in the system and we're going to have a lot easier time with that. And the last building block we're going to highlight is just how you set up your employees and resources. So um, there are a lot of different ways to differentiate employees before we were talking about the work assignment specifically, um, but there are ways to track and uh, differentiate the employee, right? As an employee, I might have three work assignments. I have one employee ID, one status as an employee. So that's ways to track your workforce outside of, you know, whatever work assignments they might have. Reasons we see this, you know, um, you might have a lot of contractors or volunteers or maybe seasonal parks and rec workers or seasonal um, election workers even, right? And so you want to track them, but they are separate from your, you know, your regular full-time or part-time workforce. So you need ways to either eliminate them from um, or exclude them from reporting or report on them separately. So by differentiating them in the system, we can do that pretty easily. Um, it also can uh, allow us to do some automatic provisioning of security based on the type of employee you're hiring or type of non-employee you're hiring, right? Maybe you have a contractor that needs access to, to view some employee data, but not all of the items that your standard employees would see, like performance evaluations and benefits. Maybe you just want them to be able to see their pay and their, um, uh, their personal information. So we could create something that would be specific to them that would be automatically assigned to that type of resource. And same thing, we can configure some forms um, and update the workflow uh, based on those types. So the most common thing we see is hiring volunteers or non-employees can be onerous if you're using the standard hire form. You don't need all of that information for someone that maybe volunteers once a week in the library, right? You don't need their social and you don't <laughs> need, you know, all of that information. So we can create a more um, pared down form based on that resource type. Right, and the important thing to note on something like that is remember that when we do that, you know, we always have that crush in HR of, you know, we've got all these employees that we have to manage and now you want us to track volunteers too or mm -hmm. our seasonal workers or our contractors. Pair those forms down, let them be conditional so that I don't have to deal with all that information. And most importantly, if I'm a manager of a volunteer and I know this volunteer has left, maybe I can figure the termination form so that I can do a simple termination on my volunteer without having to go through approvals or anything like that. 
but if they're a real employee uh, or a regular employee, you know, we might still have them use the regular form. So lots of ways to do it, so really important to note that flexibility as well. So next we're gonna highlight a couple modules that uh, we think can be really helpful in the public sector. So it wouldn't be a webinar week, I think, at RPI if I wasn't talking about talent acquisition at some point, I feel like. Um, but we can see a lot of really good uses in the TA world for this. Uh, one of the first things that I'm gonna call out is multiple job boards for our external people. So when we're talking about our county government on that first slide where we had the overall administrative functions and then the jail and then we also had um, our libraries in there, maybe we wanna have each one of those have their own job boards. And the system does support multiple external job boards so I can kind of have a pre-built position, position search built inside there. Also think about this for our summer help or our election volunteers or employees. If we want them to just kind of have a quick form and a quick application process to say, hey, I wanna be a lifeguard this summer, um, that's great. We can build out a special job board just for that. Uh, so really nice flexibility there. Job posting rules, huge when it comes to our con uh, contractual obligations. So talking about our unions and bargaining units over there, I remember we had rules that said that if we're going to be posting a job in this specific union, we had to post it internally for two weeks first, and then after two weeks, then we could post it externally. And it could only stay up for four weeks total. So if we build, our, build out our job posting rules the right way, all of that can be automated and we don't have to have our recruiters remembering to go in and unpost this at a certain point or post it internally first. Build the job posting rule, posting rule the right way. Transition management, obviously really, really important. A lot of great ways to get rid of paper processes. I think a lot of our public sector clients that we've seen, um, because it, there hasn't really been a lot of solutions out there for public sector, I feel like, um, we can get rid of a lot of these paper processes that a lot of uh, public sectors have. Um, so streamline those through transition management. Um, also think about that situation where Hannah is a science teacher, but now she wants to be an elections aide. Well, that's great. She needs to also do something else. Maybe we have to have her do an additional attestation or something to verify that she's allowed to do this. Put that in transition management, build it out the right way, put that on your job or position, and then you're gonna be able to see that right inside there. And obviously with talent acquisition, there's a lot of integrations that are built out for third-party job boards. So your Indeeds, your Monsters, et cetera, that's great. But also if you needed to post to, for example, a state civil service website or a state civil service job board, build out that integration so that we can just send out an HR XML file to them and automate that process as well. So next we have employee relations. Um, this is a pretty uh, easy to set up module. Uh, it's pretty easily configurable with some things you can toggle on and off. Uh, the coolest part about this module is how you can differentiate as many groups as you want. So if you do have five unions and every union uh, does your disciplinary action um, and grievance steps differently, you can set those up. Um, you can maybe have a non-union group that uh, doesn't need to acknowledge uh, your disciplinary actions. You can set that up. You can set up different automation emails that go out based on the step in the group, um, have a different approval. So really uh, pretty simple to set up. Not a lot of customization is needed for it. Um, but it, again, it takes you off paper and, and puts you in the system to be able to track that, to be able to see across the lifespan of this employee what uh, corrective actions were taken on them or what grievances did they file. And kind of piggybacking off of that, you know, we're gonna go right into performance management. So I mentioned before that the system does support different forms and different even rating scales by each group. So each bargaining unit might have a little bit of a different approval structure or rating scale. The system is going to allow that. Also, each one of these performance evaluations or appraisal forms that we have will support individually focal point or calendar based. So you can mix and match it across the organization. So if one union does a calendar year review, it can do that, but then another one does it based off of anniversary date. The system is built to allow that. 
Same with uh, building out by our unions or bargaining units. I mentioned that multiple times now, but mm -hmm. uh, really, really important, fundamental functionality. Same with, is this person a supervisor? We can have that built out the right way and support that. Hannah mentioned as well the, the automated reminders and prompts. So if I need to go through and say, hey, this person just uh, completed their self-evaluation, I don't want to send an email to remind my manager. It can just go out automatically. We can build out different forms and sections and weights on each one of those. And the, si the system can automatically calculate the scoring. You can also allow your managers to override it if your bargaining unit allows that. Uh, so it's a nice little function inside there. The system also comes with automatic upline approvals. So as we talk about our supervisor structure and building that out the right way, the upline approvals I know was always a really important piece for our appraisals at the, for the unions. We had to go to three layers above and the upline approvals are automatically built inside here if we want to. You can see over here for a moment, um, it's kind of tough to see, but require upline ab manager approval. And then how is it going to follow that? Is it going to follow the position structure? Is it going to find, uh, follow the supervisor structure? Really a nice way to do that. Acknowledgements and comments as well. You can require a lot of these things if you want to. Um, so if we need to have a manager sign off on it, or more importantly, the employee signing off on it to acknowledge that they've actually seen this, that's great. The system supports that. And obviously one of the most important pieces when we're talking about a unionized environment, I think, is we always wanna have our records retained. And you don't have to go through and print out the form and put it in their personnel file. Instead, the system automatically has some PDF record retention built in. Let's shift over and talk about our regulatory standards now. Fun. Ooh. <laughs> So I'm a big nerd and I actually do really enjoy <laughs> reporting, so um, feel personally attacked. On this one <laughs> um, so obviously reporting is very, very important, no matter how we slice it. So we're used to the regulatory world and we talk a lot about you know private sector and we're talking about our EEO one form that we always have to run and all that. Not to fear if you're in the public sector because the system does automatically support our EEO fours for our state and local government reports, and our EEO fives for our elementary and secondary school uh, information. So that's already built inside there. You can see there's a little screen grab of uh, some of this, and this is not a configured list or anything. This actually exists right in the system under your regulatory reporting section. Obviously, you build out your EEO codes and attach them at all levels uh, for your job or position or work assignment, and you're gonna be able to run those reports pretty much, uh, I don't wanna say that they're completely turnkey, but they're pretty turnkey. You can pretty much get those uh, built out as long as you have them attached the right way. If you are a federal contractor and you need to fill out an AAP uh, every year, or you have to do your VETS 412 or 4212, um, that is also supported out of the box in the system. So that's ready for you whenever you need it. The next piece of it, which always comes up is, you know, we talk about our HR generalists and how much, uh, how many things are on their plate already. Um, they always have to go and pull history reports or ad hoc reports just to get simple things like employee rosters. This is now built into the system. So what you can do with employee history that by itself is a new section. Uh, probably came out, I'm gonna say, probably about six or eight months ago by now. I could be wrong on exactly when. Um, but if I wanted to see the employee history by a specific employee, like everything that happened with them. If you're on S3 right now, maybe you built a report off of HR history table. Obviously, we don't have that anymore. And in the past, you would have to go to the audit log and piece it all together. But now we can actually track that through and say, show me everything that happened with this employee on a specific date range. I can also say, hey, when I put in that promotion request, what changed on it? So I can sort it by transaction. I can also go through and say, you know what? I only care about pay rate changes. So I can do that by field as well. So there's a lot of nice little functions that are inside there. And that is an out of the box report, very minimal configuration to turn that on, uh, but really nice functionality that, the, that they've added in. And for that ad hoc reporting, it's talking about the employee rosters. I need my generalist out in the field to be able to, or manager out in the field, to be able to see everybody who is certified as 
uh, an elections aid. Maybe they've got that certification, we built that out. That's great, I need to run that. I can build one single report in our, as a generalist or an admin, and I can make that public or public just to our managers list, and they're only going to be able to see the people who report to them. So again, that layer of security is innate. It's built in everywhere. Very easy for people to build that, and then they can also go through and export that to a CSV or an Excel file if they need to. And just to build on that data level security, that's one of the major concerns we hear very early on in projects. But Inboard does have a lot of delivered functionality that addresses that data security. All kind of depends on your organization and how it's structured. So Matt was just mentioning the supervisor structure. Uh, that's built in. Uh, you don't even have to turn it on. It's just part of your system using GHR. Every work assignment must have a manager. And then based on who's assigned to that manager code, they see those reports, right? They see the, their, their direct reports. Um, they can take action potentially on those reports depending on you know, what you allow within, within manager space. Span of control is cool. Um, that's something you toggle on and off pretty easy. There's a, a screenshot up there. This uh, controls what managers see when they're taking action. So if I'm gonna transfer Matt to a new position and we have thousands of active positions in the organization, span of control allows me to only see positions that report to me manager, my peers, people at my manager level, or maybe all, anyone my manager level and below. So it really narrows it down, makes it more efficient um, in processing, um, and makes it so you're not creating requisitions for positions that have nothing to do with your department, right? Um, and then actor org unit is really cool. I'm a big fan. We're implementing it at an organization right now, a public sector um, organization, uh, because they have uh, generalists across their organization and departments, and they don't want those generalists to see all resources in the organization. Um, but by default, a generalist can see all resources, right? Because their job is typically HR. HR is organization-wide. So this allows you to take a person and assign them at a department, uh, org unit, right? Org unit or maybe org unit branch with subunits and allow them to only see resources in those organization units. So a way to secure your data down um, for those maybe more super users versus just like a manager or an employee. Um, and then the other one we wanted to highlight was proxy. Sometimes a uh, taboo topic, people get nervous <laughs> about proxy. I know sometimes I get nervous about proxy, but the cool thing about Infor is that it's super layered. So you can't just proxy whatever you want. There's a couple steps. So first you have to take your role. So um, the direct supervisor role, for example, anything that a manager would have to do would be in this role and you have to make that role proxyable. So if I don't even, if I don't want anyone to proxy as an admin and have crazy security, I just don't make that an option. And then I have to go in and assign the person to be able to proxy and then also say which roles does that person have that I want to be able to proxy. So it's really layered. It can be a great tool for if I'm going to go on an extended leave and I need Matt to manage my team while I'm away instead of moving his work assignment or moving all of the resources work assignments, he can just proxy as me for you know, a couple months while I'm away. Right, and the nice thing about that as well is let's just say that I did not have the direct supervisor ST role. I don't have to have it. You do not have to change my security. Through the proxy, I'm going to be able to function as Hannah and see direct supervisor. Take action on in-basket items, approvals, mm -hmm. things like that. Yep. All right, another side of security, obviously, that's very important for our public sector clients is talking about just overall data security. Um, when we're talking about multi-tenant cloud, a lot of people are somewhat nervous about that. All of our information is living out there in the cloud somewhere. Um, so rest assured on this, um, the way Infor has built out their security on multi-tenant cloud is it's using AWS GovCloud for the US. So there is that security, it has been certified. AWS GovCloud by itself is FedRAMP certified and also supports FISMA as well. So really important that you know that that information is secure. Um, and so far as, you know, we've, we've not heard any problems with that in terms of data breaches or anything like that. Um, it is a secured environment. You don't have to worry about being married to an on-prem system. You can go and get the latest and greatest technology using a multi-tenant cloud environment and still have your data secured. So, in summary, <laughs> um, you know, we talked about this at the very beginning. There's a lot of webinars out there that RPI has done. Um, 
just keep in mind that all the things that you've seen in other webinars can apply here for our public sector clients as well. It is not just for healthcare anymore. You heard it here first. It, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, we just wanted to highlight very flexible. All the things that we've talked about can be turned on, off. Um, they can be uh, designed to fit your needs. Um, that's the great thing about the system is, you know, right. is, as long as you're coming from a, a true place of um, reviewing your design and really thinking about the needs of your system, maybe not a true lift and shift, right? We want to transform and make the system work for your needs, um, but it, it's really, it's there for you. Right, and I, I say, and I'm sure this is another one of the things that People are probably sick of me saying, at least around RPI, if not all of my clients as well. Um, Infor is really a nice big empty box. And really we only get out of that box what we put into it. So we've got some things that are, you know, that Infor delivers for us, but if we need to configure it, if we need to have some flexibility, we need to hide a field or adapt to a certain process, we absolutely can do that. So let's fill that box with all the in in important things that we need, build in that flexibility and build in how configurable the whole system is.